Hello friends, it's Kayla. Welcome to my February wrap up. Let's just get it out of the way. This was not my reading month. Here are my reading stats. If you look closely, something you will see with the ratings portion is I only had two five stars of the month of 23 reads and I had two one stars, which I haven't had a one star in a year. My average rating last month was a 3.7. This month it was a three a flat three. But at least there were some wins. I just wanted there to be more. I expected there to be more. And so I actually organized this by the rating that I thought it would be going into it. Before I read each book this month, I jotted down what I predicted my rating to be. And this is the range from what I thought would be the worst to what I thought would be the best. Things didn't add up this way and I'll talk about them one by one. Also just to note, cause I need to say this out loud, but the vlog's not gonna be out for a month, is it is a couple days into March at this point when I'm filming this, we were just away for a tournament and I'm getting around to filming it now. But my first read of the month also was a one star for March. We're actually gonna start with a book I don't have physically. That's Assistant to the Villain by Hannah Nicole Mayer, but it would be right here. I thought it would be my lowest rated of the month and indeed it was. I had a good idea about this one because I read the first chapter when I was trying to decide things to read for a Goodreads video and I thought the writing was absolutely terrible and then I ended up having to pick it up for another video concept and indeed it was terrible for me. I don't really like supervillain superhero type of stories. I also don't really love this dynamic where there's this all-powerful man and this timid girl and you know, she's learning to understand him better, but doesn't really have anything of her own going on. Like I can get on board with that if there's something with her, like it reveals something about her later. I don't know that I can even tell you the plot of this. She is assisting this guy and he, his goal is to take down um, this king, but someone is sabotaging his work. So they're all gonna work together to figure out who that is. I really hated their dynamic and I really hated her as a character. I hated the writing. I didn't think it was funny. I didn't think it was fun, but I might move on swiftly because giving a one star to something that has an average 3.9 on Goodreads is just not where I want to be in life. So let's not talk about it anymore. Uh, the next one is good news because I thought this would get a one, but actually it got a four. And that's The Handyman Method by Nick Cutter and Andrew F. Sullivan. I don't know why this needed two authors. At least it didn't feel like there was two authors. Very seamless, uh, very interesting. The way that people spoke about this is that it's about a terrible man. It's this toxic, awful husband and he's just doing awful things throughout the book. Also, there is like uncomfortable animal cruelty, which is why people don't like it, which is fair. I think this gave the exact type of horror vibes that I like. It felt satirical. It is about misogyny, but that's the point. I don't think the authors like accidentally crafted this terrible man and didn't realize he was terrible. The point is when they move into this house, this family, he gets caught up in becoming the manliest man and learning how to fix up a house and he starts to feel useless and instead of helping in ways that would actually be helpful he decides to take on this new personality of a man who can just do everything and fix everything and the house slash the internet is leading him into certain directions to connect with others with uh like mines. It was one of the stupidest horror books and if you know me and I assign the word stupid to something it means I had a good time. Usually. There was just so much silliness going on in this book. The reveal of what everything meant in the end. Ridiculous. It definitely wasn't a five star horror. It would have to do a couple other things to really convince me that this is great but I had a good time reading it. Next I put another book I don't actually have. My prediction was that I would give Six Deaths of the Saint by Alex E. Hara one star um, because, or two stars, like this is the kind of transition between one and two here, because I don't like Alexi Harrow's books. I love her writing, love her writing, her sentence structure, her, the quotes you could pull out of her books, but the plot and the characters just aren't interesting to me. I've given her a two and a three previously, and I thought, what can you do in 36 pages? I was wrong. I liked this and I gave it a four. I don't really know how to talk about it because it is 30 something pages. Um, but it is about this woman who meets the saint of war. And it's just this cyclical story partially told in second person, which is one of my favorite things. And her discovering strength and power and how that can mean different things for different people. And it was just about her making a lot of decisions with her life. It was also a love story, which I think was necessary for it to have this impact. I thought it was beautifully written as I expected, but I just, I couldn't imagine loving it. And, but I, I quite enjoyed myself. 
Um, then we have Housewoman by Adora Nora, and I put this at the prediction of a two because, like, nobody likes this. I barely heard anything about it. When I originally put it on my TBR, it was like an anticipated read of 2022. Was it 2022 or 2023? And then, like, nobody else picked it up and told me that it was incredible 2023 and that oh yeah because I just read it for a video where I was reading anticipated releases from 2023 I barely saw anybody pick it up so I I did pre-order it I think um and it just sat on my shelves and I was waiting for somebody to convince me to read it and then the only people I saw read it I had to like seek out their reviews and they didn't like it and I get that but I gave it a 4.5. I thought it was very good. We're following a woman named Ikame Funa and she's originally from Lagos and she moves to the United States to be the partner for this man. And the family is just very involved in their relationship, in her getting pregnant, in her being the perfect wife for him. Uh, they have a lot of expectations on her. They force her into situations. And obviously it's not everything that she expected the situation to be. Throughout the pages, she's trying to make the best of her situation, but she's also just desperately trying to get out of it. And there's a lot of action. The book gets pretty unhinged at the end. There are also these different perspectives that come into it of people in the neighborhood that made it so fun because you're viewing this family drama from the outside and it felt like this like neighborhood like I could imagine it as a soap opera. I thought the commentary was good, the suspense was good, it ended in a ridiculous unrealistic way and I gave it a 4.5. An Education in Malice is next. Now last year it was an anticipated release on my list and I would have said I predict this to be like a four because I gave a dowry of blood a four. Then once everyone started reading it this month and early reviews came in, I moved my rating completely down to a prediction of like a 2.5 because nobody well there are a couple people who absolutely love this but the majority of people who seem to have things in common with my taste did not vibe with it and so I moved it down to predicted 2.5 and indeed it was a 2.5 maybe like a 2.75 but I really appreciate being sent a copy of this by the publisher it makes sense why I thought and they thought I would enjoy this I don't think and I disagree with so many reviews that are saying it had beautiful writing. I just didn't see what I saw in A Dowry of Blood. And maybe that's because A Dowry of Blood is written as a series of letters. And so you're getting a character's voice when this is more of S.T. Gibson, the author's voice and language. I didn't love the writing of this and I didn't feel like it was written by the same person as A Dowry of Blood. I tried to read Camilla it's inspired by it, but it's not really similar at all besides being sapphic vampires. Um, I wanted to read it before this and then I just got bored and DNF that anyway. I wish that I had reread A Diary of Blood instead because this is a companion and people will say you don't have to read that one before this one, but I don't agree necessarily because there are ideas introduced in here that aren't very well explained but I remember them being explained in A Dowry of Blood as far as certain ideas and how vampire stuff works and I wish I had gotten reminded of that more recently because this just didn't like fully explain it. It was just focused on the relationship between Carmilla and Laura who are academic rivals and their professor who is obsessed with them, obsessed with them being together. Um, there's just this really unhealthy power dynamic in here, let alone the fact that the professor is a vampire. And I wish that it had leaned more into discussions of the power imbalance because that's what I expected this book to be. I often don't pick up books like this because I don't like reading about this power imbalance anyway of somebody taking advantage of their position. But when I do, I expect it to have the full commentary about that. There was some of it but it just wasn't all that I expected and I liked following their dynamic enough especially in class and the poetry and deciphering things but then their hate to love dynamic shifted so quickly the plot completely changed like halfway through and I think if you love their relationship and you want to read about sapphic love and the um, explicit nature of everything, then you'll probably love this. But because I wasn't already convinced of their relationship, I just like wasn't on board for everything that I was reading about. But at the same time, I love a vampire story and it was very atmospheric. So I liked elements of it. I didn't like elements of it. So my rating's landing in the middle. Up next, we've got Book of Night by Holly Black. I assume this would be like a two star because everybody seems to give it a two star. There are a lot of glowing reviews for this author for other books and then this was her adult debut and everybody seemed to have read it and not 
really vibed with it. And I too gave it around a 2, a 2.5 to be specific. I don't think it made a lot of sense. It reminded me of, have you ever had a dream or somebody else had a dream, you're trying to explain it or they're trying to explain it, and clearly like something is missing, but you can't fully grasp it because you weren't there for it. There are so many intricate details you can't possibly fully explain. It felt like Holly Black had this idea in her head for so long about this shadow magic and creatures coming from it and controlling shadows and she just knew so much in her head but then didn't really give it all to us. We have Charlie who works at a bar, she has a boyfriend, there's stuff with his shadow, there's stuff with her shadows, um, shadow singular. She is kind of like a con woman. She's been taken advantage of and put in these different situations where she has to figure stuff out and work for other people. So she's really used to that life. And she is on this hunt to find the Book of Night, whatever it's supposed to do for her, the people who want it. And it's just like a quest kind of book. But the focus is so in different places that I never understood the stakes. I never understood what was moving the plot. It didn't make a lot of sense why action was happening when it was. And I just felt like I was supposed to understand this magic system and all of these characters that Holly Black has clearly been hanging out with in her mind for years and like internally have has written already like three books in this series and this was like the fourth and the relationship was just like getting tense in here but I would have loved to see their love story because the reason this is a two point something is that relationship at the core of this it could have been so epic and the reveal near the end it could have had such an impact if we got more than just 290 pages of a half-baked plot. Let's move on to A Master of Jin by P. Jelly Clark. This I assumed would be a three because I've read novellas from authors before. I read a novella from this author, I gave it a five, and oftentimes when I go from a great novella into a full-length novel from an author it loses all the magic for me and I rate it a little bit lower. And the exact same thing happened in here. I think he really shines in writing novellas and going into this full-fledged fantasy 400 page experience there was just there wasn't enough focus in the right place and we were kind of a little bit lost. I gave this the exact rating I expected at like a three. The plot was interesting but the pace did not work for me. So we're following this woman and she is kind of an investigator detective for uh, this magical you know governing body of this community. The community doesn't know a lot about magic and jinns and all of the things that are threatening them and they're trusting this governing body to take care of them and protect them. Our detective Fatma was the weakest part of this. I don't think her character characterization fully made sense or was consistent throughout the pages and wasn't the character that I was told that she was. But the plot itself where there's this magic man coming to town and he's telling this community, I am the one who, you know, opened up magic because the city's only had magic. This is set in Cairo. It's alternate reality kind of um, 50 years ago opened the door to magic and now I'm back and here's all the things I'm going to do and here's why you should listen to me and everyone listens but the governing body is like no this is not that guy he's manipulating you and they're just trying to you know figure out who he is take him down there are all of these creatures you learn about and I had a fine time I think the relationships are also good in here um Fatima is in a relationship with a woman and also has this woman partner so there's all of this like great energy and dynamics between this group she unfortunately just couldn't carry the story in a way that I loved um when we were focused in so many different places and I just Feel like the action was misplaced would read from the author again now next i didn't technically rate this so i just put it in the middle because i also didn't predict it to have a rating i am apparently reading a smut a month it's the smut a month club join me <laughs> actually join me oh my god this month we're reading um what's it called that time i got drunk and saved a demon in my channel membership there's gonna be live shows there's gonna be a book club discussion about it so if you want to come hang out that'd be great <laughs> but in february i read sweet vengeance by Viano Onyemo. And I've decided with my Smut a Month Club, that's not actually a club, it's just me. I just happen to be reading one month for some reason. Dino Island was last month. Um, I'm not rating any of them. It doesn't matter if they go bad or great, I'm just not gonna rate them. But I think this one was good, better than Dino Island for sure. It has this woman named Joy and she um, has had a crime committed against her and she wants to take down the man who did it. 
And so she goes at the very beginning of the book, it opens with her sacrificing her body to a demon. She hears about the fact that you can sacrifice like people, she can kill an animal and sacrifice it. And she decides, no, I don't want to do that. I just want to go sacrifice my body, like my physical body. Here I am naked demon, like take me. And what I want from you is to help me take down this guy and like kind of take the blame for it or magic it away and so I don't get caught. And as expected, it's just a lot of lusty behavior. The demon immediately is like, oh my god, I have to have this woman. And he's very inexperienced. She holds his hand, helps him out, teaches him how to satisfy her. And then he in turn is very protective over her and wants to help her with her goals. I didn't feel like, and I'm probably not supposed to, I didn't feel like the real connection between them. I didn't see it and I wanted to. I wanted like the intellectual connection. That's an important part of romance for me. This isn't romance, it is smut. I get that's not what it wants to be. Um, but I would recommend, not that I am in a position to recommend one smut over another, but I thought it was fine. Moving on to The Dove in the Belly by Jim Grizzly. I assume this would be a three because I'd never heard of it. It's uh, general fiction and it was recommended by a channel member and no shade to the channel members, but like oftentimes it ends up at a middle ground rating. So I just thought a three. Guess what? I gave it a four. So the channel members have successfully gotten me a three and a four so far this year. So we have one win and one loss as far as if the members TBR jar is going to continue next year, I have to have half wins. If you liked these violent delights and real life and not really salt burn, but like kind of salt burn, not in the unhinged way, but in like the relationship, um, the push and pull dynamic. This is about two men in, is it the seventies? I feel like that wasn't part of what was pitched to me. And it's also not in here, but it's set on a university campus in, oh, now it's not going to tell me anywhere. I do believe it was the seventies. Um, we have these two men who are in school and they have a relationship. Um, but they, one of them particularly has a lot of internalized homophobia. There's a lot of potential violence for them. Um, even when people find out that they are gay or that they are together, a lot of it is set on the campus, but then an equal amount I felt like was set with one of their families. So they go together and stay with one of their families. Um, there is a sick family member and they're just spending time together having this kind of all consuming relationship while going back and forth with if this risk is worth it, if they love each other. It definitely has some uncomfortable topics the way that these people are speaking to each other, to themselves, um, but it's so beautiful. Like the actual writing of this is stunning. The amounts of the amount of things that I highlighted, the just the beautiful quotes about love and loneliness and acceptance, I really enjoyed it. I don't feel like I give general fiction a full five stars a ton. That's just a slice of life experience. Um, but I, I had a nice time with it. I would definitely recommend. Thank you to the channel member who taught me that even existed. I love hearing about books I never have before. I also thought The Vanished Birds by Simon Jimenez would also be three. I can't explain why I thought that. I just had this feeling because everyone kept telling me I was gonna love it. <laughs> I was like, no, no, they're wrong. I ended up giving it a 3.5, so I wasn't too incorrect. Um, this is a story, it feels like a bunch of connected stories. It is a bunch of connected stories about this makeshift family on a spacecraft. There's a young boy and we have this uh, woman who is tasked with caring for him. And he has this potential like ability or something's gonna happen with him. He's someone special. And she just needs to protect him until like if or when it's discovered he actually is this thing or has this thing. There were a lot of interesting things about this. I gave it a 3.5, but honestly, I'm forgetting like everything about it. I do remember there was interesting stuff about time travel, like how time worked differently in different places that I thought was interesting. There was an exploration of different um, casts and different jobs when, while they were traveling around space. And it was just a really like found family experience, which isn't something I like go crazy over the way that I know other people do. So if you love that dynamic, 
I would recommend this. I could feel the book wanted to pull on my heartstrings and it wanted me to feel really connected to these characters and feel these relationships so deeply and I just didn't. Now my prediction for Out There Screaming, my literally dead book club, oh god so wrinkly, uh, read of the month. I assume this would be a four because a lot of short story collections for me are three. Just statistically, mathematically, I'm never gonna give one a five, almost never, because it would mean every single story was a five and threes happen the most often because I'm going to give twos and threes and fours and fives and that's just where it lands and I figured this is a horror anthology I've read a handful of those how would this not be a four in fact it was a three so I was incorrect and like a low three and honestly emotionally if I were to not do the math I would have given this a two but I have to give it a three because that's just how it all worked out. I gave a lot of threes in here. I gave a lot of twos in here. Apparently I gave enough fours that it turned into a three. There was only one five star story in here. I have an entire hour long discussion with my friend Erin where we talk about every story and our individual ratings. Um, it is a speculative anthology. I wish that it called itself a speculative anthology. It's very in line with Jordan Peele's work and I think that the authors writing these stories, a lot of them felt like unfinished thoughts, honestly. Um, a lot of them I just didn't understand the point of, but they felt like they were written specifically to appeal to Jordan Peele and because of that I, and his name being on it and how much people are going to pick this up because of him, I wish that it had more of him in it. I wish that there was a longer intro. I wish that every story had an explanation, which some anthologies do. And I love when the editor says why they loved the story, why they wanted it in the collection, or to have a story from Jordan Peele himself, because it's not often an editor doesn't have a story in the collection. I'm definitely going to struggle with recommending it. There were people who loved this in the live show for sure. And a lot of the short stories worked for people. But overall, it, there was a lot of sci-fi, there was a lot of fantasy, not that that can't also lean horror, but it having zero out of the 19 stories be rooted in reality um, wasn't what the horror that I was expecting going into it. Like I wanted more of a mix that you typically get in a collection. I'll tell you my favorites though. There was one about a haunted object, which took a long time to actually get to a haunted story. That one was Dark Home by Nnedi Okorafor, which I liked. I also really like this one about um, two ghost girls on the side of a highway that was called A Bird Sings by the Etching Tree, which I gave a 4.5. And then I liked An American Fable by Chessia Burke. And my favorite, the only five star was Your Happy Place by Terrence Taylor, which I still don't think was horror, but it was a sci-fi five star. Then we have A Treacherous Curse by Deanna Rayborn, which I thought would be a four because I believe that every book in the Veronica Speedwell series is going to be a four. And I was correct. I gave it a four. I loved it. This one, or liked it, I can't say love if it wasn't a five. Um, I just love Veronica and Stoker. They're these two people in, what do you call it, like Victorian London. And they're colleagues working together in this one. There's like this museum and they're gathering artifacts and there's one that has been suspected to be stolen and then there's a man who has gone missing or died and Stoker is being implicated for it. I don't care too much about the actual mystery. I care about Veronica and Stoker and their dynamic and in here it was fantastic. Very intellectual their connection. They just have something with the, they're just so connected. They're such good partners with their their work and solving these mysteries and they know what the other person is thinking all the time they are just so in sync and we also got a lot of different like backstory and learned so much about especially stoker's past in here that's a real necessity in the series at this point so i just appreciated so much of it we met a lot of people from his past and solved the mystery so it accomplished everything it wanted to do then we've got interesting facts about space by emily austin i assume this would be a four because the other book i read from her everyone in this room will someday be dead was a four. I liked this less for sure and it felt like a really similar main character. Um, I ended up giving it a 3.5. This woman we're following is paranoid. She is obsessive and to a point where she needs to start getting professional help in her mind because she is having a hard time existing in real life with everybody around her who is neurotypical. It's a kind of slice of life. She is just figuring out herself and 
her relationship with people if she's getting into a new relationship she is having this like difficult relationship with her family members and she's figuring all that out in the pages she thinks she has a stalker and she has this fear um of bald men and so she believes she's being followed by one and she just needs somebody to like talk her down explain to her why her mind works the way it does the character arc was interesting to follow i didn't care too much about the plot and then it got like wild at the end which i wasn't expecting that's that next we have the secret to a southern wedding by cynthia williams this was like a hallmark movie in a book i figured it would be a four because i like to go into romance because uh, I picked them up so few and far between, I assume they're going to be great. I ended up giving it a 2.5, so this was one of the most incorrect guesses that I had, but not really surprising with my track record with romance. It is about this woman who has a mother who's getting remarried, but she has never, our main character, um, Imani, has never met the man, and she does not support her mother getting married to somebody because... She, like why was she hiding this relationship this entire time when she gets to the small town which that was like the number one best thing about this was building the small town vibe the environment um all of the people all of the little businesses it was very inviting but i really hated this main character i could not stand her i didn't like the love interest he is actually the son of the guy her mom is marrying so they're about to be step siblings but they have this undeniable connection apparently that I didn't see. It also just had no fun wedding content because she's trying to stop the wedding. It sounds like it's going to be a cute wedding planning thing. There was like nothing about the actual wedding and it also says it's funny in a rom-com and it wasn't. I'm sorry it wasn't. <laughs> and also there was no steam so just like what was I reading for? It wasn't fun. It wasn't sexy. Where am I? Next up What Lies in the Woods by Kate Alice Marshall. I thought this would be a four. I went into it with the expectations that other people didn't really like it, but there are people who absolutely loved it. And I figured a lot of books that I could describe like that get a four from me. And yes, it was a four. These characters are so memorable and vivid to me. It's about this woman who, when she was like 11, got stabbed many, many times in the woods and survived along with two of her friends. And she sent the man to prison who was suspected of doing it. He was like a proven serial killer. Now, 10 years later, I think it was 10, maybe 20, um, he has died in prison and it's the, a question of, did he actually do it? She's reconnecting with people. She's going back to the town. Um, she's meeting up with her friends and like every other person who was around at the time who helped her, who challenged her. And the girls have this secret that they have kept all of these years that's going to get revealed. There are like five reveals in here. So even if you see one coming, there's something else happening. There's a lot of red herrings. I couldn't give it a five because there are a couple plots in characters that were just dropped. It did get a little over the top at the end and a lot happened really fast which I liked but then because of that it was a lot of like villainy and got a little bit cheesy but overall I had a really good time. The atmosphere, the characters, I was surprised and entertained and that's what I'm looking for. Oh on the other hand again I predicted this would be a four because some people love it, some people hate it. Um, I gave this a one. This is one of the worst mystery thriller suspense books because it's not any of those things that I have ever read. It was so incredibly dry. There is this woman who we do learn in the synopsis and at the very beginning had this relationship with this man who manipulated her, um, was not good for her, their relationship when they were younger. And at that time, a friend of her died, a friend of hers died, and he was there when it happened. And now 20 years, is this one that was 10 years later, 20 years later, seven years later. Wow. Terrible, terrible, Kayla. Um, another person died in front of this man. And so our main character, Maya, is convinced he's responsible because he's manipulative. And um, it's about manipulating people's memories. <laughs> and so that's what it is. She, she confronts him. She figures out everything that happened and it's just the most flat experience ever. I just genuinely didn't understand why you would write a story like this. <laughs> I'm getting so annoyed just thinking of it again because I know that this, ha this has an audience and I don't think that it's gonna be shitty for everyone, but like I would 
I would just, and no, I'm not an author, like what a shitty thing to say. I feel like this could be rewritten to be a good story because it's not that the reveal itself is bad. I just don't think she knew how to write a book. Um, there are so many ways this could have been written differently and it could have been compelling having the same reveal at the end. Give us like an actual villain of a character who's actually in the pages, like current day. If you're gonna tell us there's this villain, like, okay, let him be in it. If you're gonna give us this character who's investigating stuff, like let her actually have a personality and be intelligent and like have a goal and a plan. It was just happening. The words were just happening. There wasn't a thought behind them. And like Reese Witherspoon is on a different planet telling people, hundreds of thousands of people to read that. Like I know I have a book club, but like I, I'm reading the book with the people. It would be a completely different experience if I was reading it first and I had to tell people what I think was worth their time. <laughs> with that said, I bought this with my own money. This was on my TBR. I chose this. I wanted to read it. I was incorrect. Next up, I thought A Taste of Golden Iron by Alexander Rowland would be like a five-star fantasy. <laughs> Can I explain why? No. I think just because it's been on my shelf for a while, the people, I haven't heard a ton of people talk about it, but the people that I did, it was, it was a rave. It was like a, this is an incredible standalone fantasy you have to read. And I just thought it was okay. I gave it a three. I think there was a real missed opportunity for the fantasy and the magic of this because there's this concept about, um, what's it called? Taste touching or something like that, that I really thought would be the plot. And then we kind of lost it. Um, there are these people who infiltrate this kingdom. We have a queen, her queen, her queen, the queen, this is her brother and he did something like with his armsmen in the woods um they have this like sexual relationship um i the dynamic of it is questionable um and they are responsible for some deaths that happened and the queen is like i this guy can't work here anymore but he's like i will be responsible for him like let us do our own thing and then she's like okay but i have to give you this bodyguard and so he gets his bodyguard and they all just like Kind of hang out and they all just kind of like hate each other have weird um tension sexual tension the characterization was really good the characters were all distinct they were so interesting and they were so different and you could tell that the author really knew the characters that she wanted to build and then there were so many interesting concepts in here and i loved getting to learn about the world but there wasn't enough there wasn't enough world building there wasn't enough of this relationship that i expected to be like the focus and i was just waiting for like the plot to really make sense i was waiting for a quest to be established an adventure like a purpose we were just kind of waffling for half the book and i didn't know what the intent of it was and then we did get that quest element and they had to accomplish a goal but by then i was just kind of bored by it so i'm giving it a middle rating because it wasn't bad the writing was good i just wanted to care a lot more than i did another book that i predicted to be a five Parable of the Sower by Octavia E. Butler because I read Kindred and gave it a five and thought, obviously, Octavia E. Butler is an icon. And guess what? I did give it a five. This is a dystopian book. The world has been devastated by climate change. There's a lot of violence. Uh, there's a lot of crime and very little control over the population. It's kind of every man for himself. People live in these small communities with lots of fences and protection. And we're following this girl named Lauren who starts off the book at 15 years old and she has this ability to physically feel empathy. And so she can tell when someone, she feels the same pain that other people feel. If she inflicts something on someone, she will feel an equal amount. So there's a lot of like survival in here. There's a lot of just very bleak content where she's going around finding people who have been injured, assaulted, um, harmed in various ways. And she, this protection is so important and she's protecting other people um, while also like kind of building her own religion and just has this, these very fascinating concepts that we get to read. And we know that we're reading from the future um, from the book that she ended up writing, which is just interesting, like foreshadowing. But she has this fear that, or she has this lack of understanding if she were to ever kill someone and had to be in this life or death situation would she also die like what would what would happen with her ability it is very dark and bleak but there is also this hope filled note to it um i am not doing this book service at all trying to describe it i'm sure other people have done great discussions about this 
I loved it. What I didn't love was another five star prediction. And this one also like was not a fair assumption that I would give this fantasy five stars, but it's One Dark Window. I don't have it. I listened to the audiobook. It's the first book in a series by Rachel Gillig. And I thought it would be a five. I gave it a two. The two is for the concept of like mind control. I really love the idea of being able to be in other people's minds, control other people, um, like hive minds, shared consciousness. Love that idea. And we're following a young woman who has been infected, has this had this illness as a child and this like dark nightmare spirit figure has entered her consciousness so they share her mind she can communicate with him and he can also like kind of control her body and can save her in a lot of situations so a lot of the book is her calling out to this nightmare going I'm so hurt save me I'm so sad save me which is not inherently bad I just found her annoying as shit the plot has to do with gathering these magical cards. There are 12 cards, everybody wants to collect them. And once you do, you can do something with them. There are different groups of people who wanna collect them, who have opposite kind of ideas. If you collect all the cards, you can stop this magic from infecting people. It's basically a magical plague. Um, I just found it really simplistic. I was confused if I was confused or if it just wasn't like explained very thoroughly or interestingly. It had the most uninteresting cast of characters I have I have witnessed in a while and I'm shocked by the amount of people saying that like they were obsessed with them and their relationship. There's this guy named Raven who is a part of um, the kingdom and seeing him as this like swoon worthy love interest, I don't get it at all. There was also just no urgency in the plot. They were focused on so many other things when there was these dire circumstances that we just kept forgetting about. It was definitely atmospheric. It wanted to be gothic. I feel like it could have gone a little bit further. Um, I don't know. The writing itself was okay. It was, but the plot, like, I don't know. I didn't care about anything. And that was unfortunate because people love it. Like it's such a highly rated one. I don't know what happened. Okay, the next one I thought would be five stars. Oh, I'm in my flop era here. Uh, they Were Here Before Us by Eric LaRocca. I don't think I gave this a terrible rating. What did I write down? Three stars. This was about like animals and bugs. I think that's the concept of They Were Here Before Us, that like creatures existed um, before humans. And it's a collection of stories from the perspective of bugs, about bugs. I just, I didn't I didn't really love any of them. Um, the first one was intriguing, I remember, and it was one that definitely gave horror vibes. It's a horror short story collection. It says it's a novella, but I don't understand. The feelings were more confusion over disgust. So I really don't have anything to say about this. Not my favorite from that author, but I've read some really good ones. Um, this one I thought would be a five just because Tinfoil Butterfly was and The Insatiable Volt Sisters by Rachel Eve Moulton sounded like the perfect gothic island sisterhood story that I like. It had so many elements that I love, but then it was also very uh, basic and not a unique kind of story. So it ended up not doing a ton for me and I gave it a 3.5 ish. It is about these half sisters and they grew up a little bit together and then were separated and now they're coming back together for their father's funeral on this island. The island like doesn't want people there like that feels like kind of the vibe like there are missing women and there's a lot of different perspectives in here and timelines from when they were children to current day. It's not just them but there's also um another two or three other perspectives of people in their lives um, who are just talking about their experiences with their father with the island learning things. It's so hard to decipher the plot of this besides just like women coming together trying to figure out what their father was up to. It's like a haunted gothic fairy tale leaning horror. I guess you put it in the horror category. The final third was so interesting and odd but I was tired by then like this did not need to be this long of a book it could have been a novella and it could have hit super hard but it's really forgettable it was just felt kind of generic by the end I don't have anything else to say about it uh the biggest flop this five star prediction so sad about uh, now you're one of us by Asa Nanami this I put as a five star prediction because my friend Justin, if you saw my like reading bookstagram favorites, um, he had it in his favorites last year and I wish that I had picked it over Mary. And I've been thinking about it ever since and I was gonna include it in a 
uh, like writing my wrongs kind of video. But I ended up reading it instead for my 1990 trying or 1993. I think it was 1993 trying to find a five star from that year. And this was not interesting. <laughs> there was a bit of it that was interesting. And I'm talking a bit the tiniest bit. Most of it you're just following this woman who I see how other people could be really into. I don't like following this character who is so easily convinced and manipulated by people and doesn't have a strong like will of their own. She's getting invited into this family. She's going to move in with her new husband and his family. And she starts to question if they're doing something criminal because there's criminal activity around them. And she is asking them like outright directly, are you doing something bad? Uh, she's kind of investigating them behind the scenes and just trying to like figure out if they're bad, but not by actually like really doing anything, just wondering to herself, are they doing anything bad? And then she, they say no, we're not. And then she goes and talks to her friend. She has this one close friend in the book and she's like, they're a fine family. And the friend is like, you need, they're, they're lying to you. And so she goes back to the family and the family's like, your friend is lying to you. She goes back to her friend and she's like, they said that you're the one, but it's just like this back and forth exhausting, tiring book. It's, I feel like meant to be a suspense in this battling of the minds and wills, but I was bored. I thought because Justin, who I have so much in common with, had this as a five star that it would just be a five star for me and be that perfect weird book that I could then recommend to people. And I'm glad that other people love this because I just, it didn't work for me. Um, it got like unhinged and uncomfortable, which was kind of fun, but it didn't then go far enough. It was definitely gross. The reveals were interesting, but that didn't make up for the 200 pages that I was just uninterested, super uninterested, especially when you as the reader feel like you know the answer to everything and you're supposed to know before the character. That's not like the most fun to me. But the final book I thought would be a five star was Knock Knock Open Wide by Neil Sharpson. Can't explain why I thought this would be a five star. I just looked at the cover, you know, read the title and the vibe sounded just like something that could be really fucking weird and that I would give five stars and then I gave it five stars and I'm so glad. So the first 30 pages of this are so odd and unsettling and it's this woman and she's driving and she sees something horrifying on the road and that just leads to like a night of terror. Um, we don't get all of the insights at that moment. It just feels odd. And then we flash to like 20 years in the future and we're following a different woman. And it's like this slice of life story now where there's this relationship she's starting with another woman in school and they're just figuring out their lives. It's this generational story and there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of hardship. Um, but you're not let in on everything. It's like every chapter flashes to a completely different timeline. And there's also kind of a mixed media element because there's interviews and articles. And the entire time you are unsure of what's actually going on. It feels like a bit of a frustrating read to get to the answers, but the writing of this is like next level. I'm obsessed with the way that this is written can't explain it. Don't know what it was in, in specifics, but I would read anything that this author writes. It was poetic and odd and just the descriptions. I was highlighting so much as we learn about this family history. And then there's this, it's like a fairy tale almost. Then there's this children's TV show that everyone remembers from childhood. And maybe there's something sinister going on with it. And they're going to find something out about like, what was going on during the filming of it. I just had so much fun reading it and I can't even explain the plot very well. It was just a fascinating time. And if you like weird things where you're just like sucked into this strange world that you don't understand, I would definitely recommend it. But I don't think it's just like a horror that everybody will read and love. It's Irish mythology, unsettling, but then just like mundane at the same time. Oh my God. I loved it. And those are the 23 things that I read in the month of February. I'm glad there was a couple wins and I know some people, you know, it takes them even longer to find a five star. So I'm lucky that I have discovered some, but overall it felt like a real flop. And March isn't off to a great start either, but I think I can turn it around. So we'll see how that goes and I will see you later.